Good evening. My name is Kevin Glenn. I'm a volunteer with People for Clean Mountains. We have the honor of Dr. Neil Seldman here tonight to give us a presentation on some things we can do to help our community. Dr. Neil Seldman is the president of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. The Institute's mission since 1974 is to provide innovative strategies, working models, and timely information to support sound and equitable community development. To this end, ILSR works with citizens, activists, policymakers, and entrepreneurs to design systems, policies, and enterprises that meet local or regional needs to maximize human, material, natural, and financial resources, and to ensure that the benefits of these systems and resources accrue to all local citizens. Neil provides technical assistance to cities, community groups, and businesses in the field of resource management. He has pioneered developments in processing, building, deconstruction, and small-scale manufacturing from recycled materials. He describes collection strategies at lower costs, incentive to households and businesses to recycle and the types of reuse, composting, and recycling companies that could be located in our community. Neil has also chronicled the U.S. recycling movement in the last 50 years in several publications. He has documented worldwide, worldwide recycling developments for the World Bank. He is a founding member of the National Recycling, recycling Coalition and the Grassroots Network Recycling Network. Dr. Seldman is known as a grassroots organizer who shows communities how to fight against and how to fight for the sustainable solution to solid waste and economic problems. In recent years, he has worked in Atlanta, Cleveland, Gainesville, Florida, Reading, PA, Washington, D.C., Bridgeport, Connecticut, Austin, Texas, Los Angeles, California, and Chattanooga, Tennessee. He writes regularly for trade journals, providing insight and criticism of poorly designed technologies and programs. He co-founded the Institute in the Adams Morgan neighborhood of Washington, D.C., and was a manufacturer in New York and a university lecturer in political science prior to that. So please welcome Dr. Neil Seldman. Thank you. I, I'm unused to the doctor title since I haven't been a professor for 30 years, but thank you anyway. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, Kevin and the uh, PCM folks are great hosts, and you've got a great community here, so I've had a, a fun day, including a home-cooked dinner, so I'm, I'm very satisfied. Um, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the types of companies, the actual companies, that you may want to attract here through your government policy and private sector policy. And then uh, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about why uh, the county is right for this, given your landfill circumstances and economic circumstances. Um, raise your hand if I say something that's unclear. I don't mind answering questions right away. But afterwards, I hope we have a very lively dialogue like we had uh, earlier today uh, uh, with some local, uh, with your county officials uh, and a, a number of other folks. So um, uh, let me uh, just uh, take a, a one minute to, to point out that we are an economic development organization, as, as Kevin mentioned. Uh, we feel very much at home with uh, PCM because they're, they're doing the same thing. Um, PCM and the Institute often get uh, uh, accused of being environmentalists, which we don't mind, but it's not accurate, although we don't mind being environmentalists. But we really focus on economic development. And of course, we want clean economic development, like you guys want clean mountains. And um, it's possible to do it, and uh, we've got a, a, a lot of lists of accomplishments. Uh, besides solid waste management, um, we work in energy, uh, agriculture, urban agriculture, uh, internet communications, broadband, uh, which is of, of note here in North Carolina given uh, the laws that came in last year, I think. And we also work in uh, small uh, independent business networks. We've set up several around the country. Uh, and you could go to our web page, which is ilsr.org, and see all the four or five initiatives that we work on. I work on uh, the waste to wealth or garbage program, um, although the quality is very good. Um, <clears throat> OK, another minute on why recyclables are so valuable these days. And that's because of population growth. We now have six or seven billion people in the world. Each time a kid is born, it's more resources, more water, et cetera. And 
half that population lives in Asia, China and India and other Asian countries, and they are starting to consume like we consume, which means that not only is the population growing, but the consumption of that population is escalating very quickly. As one professor once said in a lecture I heard, the Chinese not only want Coca-Cola, they want ice in their Coca-Cola, which is pretty energy and, and, and uh, resource intensive. The other part of the story, uh, given the population and, and consumption demand, is that the resources we need, uh, oil, uh, gas, um, the low-hanging fruit, getting those resources to make things out of uh, use energy, uh, is gone. So we're drilling a mile beneath, beneath the sea uh, in the Caribbean with tragic results. Uh, we're fracking for natural gas, which uh, has uh, very uh, important uh, negative impacts on farmers, on people, uh, uh, just regular consumers who have to deal with contaminated water. So uh, all of these things come together to make the recovered materials, paper, plastic, glass, far more valuable than, let's say, 10 or 15 years ago. And you could just get the trade journals and look at the charts of prices of, of newsprint. When uh, the Institute was started in the early 70s, um, when, uh, there was a, when the economy was going sort of sluggish, you could get rid of paper for $5 a ton newspaper. When the economy was going well, you could get $20 a ton. Well, right now it's about $100 a ton. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, manufacturers uh, will, will pay even more. And that those pricing uh, has, has, has followed. Uh, there are, of course, dips in the market, like any market. Uh, but those combinations of low-hanging fruit being gone, population growth, and finally the cost of disposal um, are driving people to recycle, including compost. And the cost of disposal, uh, you're, you're aware of. Uh, you have relatively low costs here, uh, although I was surprised to hear that you're in the $50 per ton range here. I was assuming it was about 30. Uh, but in the uh, Northeast, you could pay $100 a ton for disposing of, of solid waste. So when you recycle something, you not only get value, positive value, you avoid a negative value. So uh, in some cases, it, uh, uh, it doubles the value of the material by combining the market price and the uh, vo cost avoidance. Okay, um, so therefore there are many, many new companies that are popping up literally uh, to take advantage of the value of the raw materials in the solid waste stream. Uh, the key is keeping things separate. If you mix everything together, you've got garbage and you have to pay someone to take it away. If you keep it separate, you have a commodity that has value. Um, let me just give you a sense of four or five of these uh, companies. Um, I, uh, Diane Harl, who's with PCM, could not be here tonight. She's my main information exchange person. Uh, we sent her today a chart of all the companies I'm going to mention with the number of jobs, the capital requirement, the raw material they need, and the space they need. All the companies I'm mentioning do not need capital. They have their own capital. There are opportunities for local investors, but we represent no company that is coming to a city or county asking for money. Uh, they may ask you to use your industrial revenue bonds, uh, something you would do uh, for any company that, that wants to come into your county, uh, but they will not be asking you to subsidize their capital investment. Um, okay, uh, the three types of companies and, um, uh, that I'll talk about are one I'll call mid-sized manufacturing companies, 100 jobs, uh, 5 to 10 acres. Uh, other companies are quite small, uh, repair and reuse companies, basically 20,000 square feet, 20 workers per company. And then there are the uh, really small companies, all of which uh, deal with organic matter, composting, gasification, uh, using food waste, yard debris, and soil papers, a pizza box that has grease on it that can't be recycled but is very good for composting. So those are the three categories. I'm going to hit a few companies in each of those areas, and um, uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how you might go about uh, recruiting these companies. And finally, we'll just have a discussion of anything I said or missaid uh, will come to light. Okay, um, one company, uh, this is not in any particular order, is a company uh, called Gray's Paper Company, G-R-E-Y-S. Uh, they're based in Edmonton, Canada. <coughs> They just opened up their first plant. It's a small-scale, high-quality paper manufacturer. 
Uh, I know that you have experience with paper companies here and that you've lost a big one, which obviously is tough on a, on a community. Uh, that was a very large plant. We're talking about a very small 40 ton per day plant, which requires 36 tons a day of high grade white paper uh, and four tons a day of recycled, uh, uh, yeah, recycled linen, uh, sheets, uh, towels, uniforms um, uh, that you can get from colleges, hospitals, etc. Uh, this company pays market price for these materials. Uh, they need four and a half to five acres. Uh, they have an 80,000 square foot building. It's actually a dome. You could go up on the web page and take a look at it, grayspaper.com. It may be grayspapercompany.com, but I'm, I'm sure you'll find it. <clears throat> they built it, they use the dome technology because it's cheapest construction, best insulation, and it's the best for withstanding tornadoes and hurricanes uh, for, for safety. Um, they, uh, the, the plant uh, is 100 workers in the plant and roughly another 20 workers in distribution. They produce high quality stationery, uh, envelopes, uh, copy paper, uh, and they have one uh, lower grade uh, product which are uh, file folders, folders for office, uh, office filing. Um, the plant costs $12 million, 10 to $12 million, uh, in Edmonton, Canada, which is a very rich city, they've got uranium, natural gas, and all kinds of oil, um, the city actually uh, owns 50% of this plant. They've invested about $6 million, um, and uh, they also rent the space uh, where the, the, the plant is located. Um, the, the company now is not asking any government for money. Uh, they would love for a city or a county to do like the city of Edmonton, did and invest in them. I advise them that I know of no community in the United States except for San Francisco that has six million dollars spare change around and they probably don't have it. Um, so uh, the owner, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Aluelia, um, uh, uh, knows that uh, and he's uh, working with a couple of cities we've introduced them to uh, to uh, work out a deal. Uh, the, the first MOU he signed was in Reading, Pennsylvania, uh, which is uh, uh, among the poor cities in the country, and uh, we're, we're very pleased that they're working on building, uh, getting to the point to, to break ground there. Um, the company uh, uh, wants local investors. If the city can't invest as a public entity, they would like to know if local investors are interested. And for a $12 million plant, usually uh, investors have a minimum investment of quarter of a million or so, or half a million. Um, they, uh, the Grays people, have lowered the buy-in price for uh, limited partnerships to $10,000 a unit, which means they want uh, relatively small investors. You could obviously buy more than 10000 but that would be the, the minimum. And um, the only requirement they have is that the raw material that they need uh, is, uh, they'll pay market price, so if you have a public uh, recycling program, they would want uh, the city or county to guarantee that the high grade paper they need, they have first right of refusal to buy that material. Uh, they'll, they'll obviously pay market rate. Um, so that's one uh, company that uh, I, I think I mentioned it's four and a half to five acres um, and uh, that includes parking uh, for workers and it includes uh, you know truck turnaround. Uh, one plant will have ten trucks coming in a day and tech, ten trucks going out a day bringing in raw material and taking out product, um, which is uh, not, uh, does not overly burden a community that obviously doesn't want too much truck traffic. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. How, how do they manage to get the high quality white paper feed? How do you, how do they, you work that out? I mean, they buy it. Trash, right? so, well, you've got to have a separate system for collecting this. Does that mean you have to be sourcing from a fairly large uh, urban area where offices crank this out. That's the part that I see as the... Uh, well, the paper, they buy, the paper they buy has to be source separated. Um, they, they will not take paper that's already been mixed with garbage. They won't even take paper that's already been mixed with recyclables. Your county here has uh, what's called a uh, single stream where you mix all... They will not take that paper. Uh, we're working with them in Austin, and Austin, the city of Austin has a very uh, advanced recycling program. They're, uh, they're working on establishing separate routes just to get the paper if this company comes in. 
uh, because uh, also Austin has a single stream system, but they have to devise how to uh, draw material out of the waste stream that is a high quality paper that's source separated. Um, and they'll, they'll, pay, they'll pay for it. Uh, I don't know what the going price for recycled uh, uh, high-grade paper, maybe $150, $200 a ton. Uh, the key to their economic success is that their cost of production is two-thirds that of a large-scale mill, given their new technology. And therefore, they could sell their paper for, let's say, $900 a ton, whereas a, a large company would have to go for $1,200 a ton because they have higher uh, production costs. Yes, miss? Well, I was just wondering what kind of some scale, when you say they needed how much paper a day? 36 tons per day. So is there some way to put that in perspective? Like, what does that mean? Like, uh, well, high-grade paper is, let's say, 5% uh, of your waste stream. Uh, and if your county here uh, doesn't have enough material, it could literally import it. You have brokers here uh, in the county. They could deal with paper. Uh, it could be a joint project with Henderson County or some of the other uh, counties that are surrounding you. Um, so, um, so it, obviously it's a concern, and, um, but it's very interesting, this company, we're working in Reading, Pennsylvania, which is about 30, 40 miles from Philadelphia, and in the initial discussions, the city folks said, well, if we don't have enough paper in Reading, uh, then uh, we could always get paper from Philadelphia. And uh, the owner, uh, Mr. Uh, Alawelia, is very insistent that he wants to build plants to serve one particular city. Uh, so he will try to uh, he'll obviously do research and identify the sources of material before he will build a plant. And he will look local, locally first. Uh, that, that's his philosophy, uh, which is why we like working with him. Uh, we're decentralists, he's a decentralist, uh, and we, we just, uh, our philosophies integrate. I, I should point out, um, the Institute takes no money from these companies or else uh, you would not believe what I'm saying, and you shouldn't if I was working for them. Uh, we work with them because they represent real alternatives that we could point to for cities and counties to decentralize their economy. Another company um, is, uh, is called New Life Glass. It's a British company. Uh, they just opened up their first plant in Buffalo, New York. And what they do is they take CRT screens, the leaded gl glass screens for your computers, uh, typewri uh, typewriters, televisions, etc. And uh, this material has absolutely no market. Uh, nobody knows what to do with it because you can't put it in the landfill in many states, including North Carolina, because they're, they're such heavy contaminants. Well, he's developed a specialized furnace uh, that can separate the lead from the glass, and then he sells both products. Uh, one furnace is about 30 workers. Uh, he envisions a plant uh, with three furnaces, so roughly 90 workers plus administrative uh, staff for the company. Um, he just opened up his uh, uh, first plant in Buffalo. Uh, we've attracted him to uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, uh, where the Institute works, um, and uh, they're in negotiations with a private company to rent uh, space, manufacturing space, and uh, to buy energy from a paper mill that already, a corrugated cardboard mill that exists in the city that has excess capacity on their uh, energy generation. And where, uh, uh, you, when I facilitate this, very often I'm told to leave the room because I don't need to know the details and the business and the, the bargaining going on. Uh, we're just happy that it's going on and hopefully will come to fruition. Uh, the CRT plant, as I said, is roughly 100 jobs, 90 to 100 jobs. And um, Mr. Simon Greer, made a, after his plant in Buffalo opened just last month, he made a speech in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, describing his company. And he's been inundated by cities and counties that want him to locate, because no one can figure out what to, to do CRTs. It's a tremendous liability. They're filling up uh, warehouses and uh, all over the country. So we expect uh, many, many plants over the next decade uh, that both these companies, Gray's Paper and New Life Glass, uh, will be uh, building all across the country. Do flat screen TVs have the same kind of problem? Um, I believe so. Uh, I, I would have to check with uh, Simon to see exactly what, uh, what, he, um, what he accepts as a, as a feedstock. The CRTs are dying technology. That's correct, but the inventory of CRTs is, is enormous. Yeah. In fact, when he decided, uh, when he was attracted to Reading and came and made a site visit and started talking to the business people, um, he asked about you know, what's going on with electronic recycling. And I made some phone calls to the electronic recyclers in the 
uh, Reading area and ask them if this company locates how many uh, CRT screens can you, how many tons of CRT screens can you deliver? And both companies said it's limitless. Uh, they, they, they could get it. If they have a, a legal, legitimate outlet, they could get it. Um, okay, uh, any other, yes, miss? Uh, I, um, yes, I'm sure it does, and I will find it for you. The name of the company is New Life Glass. I think it's N-U Life Glass. Uh, but I will, I will get that through Diane Hall. I'll make sure you can get their web page. I'm, I'm sure they do have a web page. So yes, one, one piece I just didn't quite catch is what are they doing with the glass? They're, they're selling it. So no, no, you said they're, do you have, they have a furnace that is, going, is doing what? Separating? At something? high temperatures, it separates the glass from the lead. Okay, and I, then they sell the They glass. sell both products. They sell, okay, yeah, gotcha. But uh, again, I, okay. uh, you would need Simon to explain his technology, if he will. He, if these are proprietary uh, uh, businesses and are not required to tell everyone okay. their, their secrets. But uh, obviously, Simon. But just separating it and selling it. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so, uh, again, uh, people who are interested, uh, businesses, I, um, if you're just a citizen wanting information, I suggest you don't call because he'll be overburdened. If you're a business person that's thinking of investing or if you're a uh, city or county official that wants to recruit that company, I'd be very happy to facilitate a conference call, which is basically what I do with these companies. Um, Okay, another uh, a relatively large-scale company is a company called FlexPave, F-L-E-X-P-A-V-E, -E, two words. What they do is they manufacture road surfaces, street surfaces, um, that walkway surfaces that are permeable. They make their, their material mostly out of crumb rubber. That's old tires with the steel and polyethylene taken out of it, uh, and the materials are reduced to sand, uh, pieces of little sand, hence crumb rubber. You may be familiar with larger pieces of crumb rubber, like a quarter inch, that are used to mix with asphalt for your roadways, which is a very good idea. It uh, helps the roadways last longer, etc. cetera. Um, but the real value of, 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 if you really crumb your rubber and get this, these sand-sized uh, pieces, you can then sell your rubber, uh, the material, back to manufacturers who use rubber like tire companies, like companies that make gaskets, the companies that make soles uh, on your shoes, et cetera. Um, and um, this particular company uses it to make this permeable uh, pavement. And permeable, permeable pavement or road surfaces saves you millions of dollars because water goes down to the ground. It doesn't flow through your wastewater system, which requires energy. It requires chemicals. Uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with the cost of, of, of those systems. Um, so those are three companies that um, right uh, where we, uh, tomorrow we could start uh, setting up phone calls if you have investors uh, or if you have city officials, county officials that want to try to attract these companies. Um, okay, I, I could talk about, well, let me, let me talk about one more because we had an earlier conversation about plastics. Um, uh, my friend, uh, uh, Bill Kuhn, C-O-O-N, uh, operates a company called Bill Kuhn Manufacturing, oddly enough. Uh, he's located in Missouri. He's about to retire. He's uh, perfected a way of taking recycled polypropylene plastic and recycled uh, high, uh, HDP, high-density polyethylene, basically milk jugs, among other common uh, products we use. And <clears throat> He mixes those, I don't know the ratio, with virgin plastics, same types of plastics, to make an array of uh, products, uh, farm products, um, uh, um, helicopter seats. His biggest business the last few years out in Missouri is as the water tables and lakes have sunk, the docks are inadequate for getting the boats to the water, so he's been building boat, uh, boat dock extensions out of this material. Uh, that's been his largest use in the last couple of years. Uh, as I, I was telling uh, this gentleman, uh, he has uh, three technologies from uh, sheeting technology to uh, rotational molding to vacuum forming. Each technology uses, produces a different type of product, uh, uh, which you could go into, uh, look at, by going to his webpage, which is, I believe, uh, kuhnmanufacturing.com. It could be hillkuhnmanufacturing.com. Um, Again, he's retiring. His business has a 400-mile radius. 
He's based in Spickard, Missouri, which is very remote, uh, about an hour north of Kansas City. And uh, he, um, he is very open to working with entrepreneurs in, around the country to help replicate his plant. Uh, he, uh, he's told me that he needs a, a day fee for consulting. He doesn't need royalties. Uh, he will work with people on finding markets and sourcing materials, uh, the, sourcing the raw materials that you need. One of the clever uh, things he's picked up over the years, he buys uh, some of his plastics from train wrecks. Whenever there's a train wreck, the insurance company wants to get rid of the material as quickly as possible. So he picks up, if there's a train load of recycled plastic, he just buys it at low prices and ships it up by truck to his uh, plant in, in Spickard. Um, so he's, the, the, all of these folks are very innovative people, and they're, they're nice to hang out with because uh, they're exciting. They're excited about their product, their company, uh, so it makes it fun to be in the business. Okay, um, let me switch to the nonprofit sector. Uh, this is the reuse repair uh, type of companies we operate. And we, op we, we work in this in, in partnership with a group called <clears throat> St. Vincent de Paul of Eugene, Oregon. St. Vincent de Paul is a worldwide uh, religious uh, order, I think that's the right term, but each one, wherever they're located, are completely independent. So if there's a St. Vincent de Paul here in, in Transylvania County, they have nothing to do with St. Vincent de Paul in Eugene, or for that matter, in St. Vincent de Paul in another county nearby. But in the mid-80s, uh, this particular, it's a nonprofit, of course, um, <clears throat> they were facing, they were living in a community that was devastated by the downturn in the uh, lumber uh, industry. That part of the country, Eugene, Oregon, was the major supplier of plywood from generations in, in the country. It all evaporated. If you read the Lorax, you could figure that out, what happened. Um, and um, uh, the economy was devastated. Uh, they, uh, they started out with thrift stores, and people who were donating material to the thrift store lost their jobs and went to the thrift store to get stuff. Uh, and they have, they have quite a, an interesting policy. They have 12 stores in the uh, Eugene metropolitan area. <clears throat> they, uh, uh, they're very, very clever people. Uh, they, uh, they know how to take in clothing and pocketbooks and shoes. Uh, they have a repair section and they sell the high quality stuff on eBay. They put the uh, regular stuff in their stores. Uh, if a low-income person can't afford it, they could just take it. Uh, they have wide project, uh, profit margins. Uh, I, I don't know the exact numbers. I think they gross about four or five million a year. They've got uh, just under 500 employees. Uh, and they, uh, since the depression, recession of 2008-9, they have added 100 jobs and increased wages. What do they do to, uh, to get all this money? They recover products, not re recyclables, but products appliances, cars, uh, well, appliances, refrigerators, furniture, mattresses. Um, and they recycle some of it, but they also refurbish. Uh, and they do a great job. Uh, if you get an appliance from them and it breaks, they'll repair it, uh, they'll uh, uh, replace it uh, if you're the original owner, which means their technicians have to be very good or else uh, they'll start losing money. All of their employees come from uh, under or unemployed uh, people in the community, they're trained. Uh, minimum wage, $14 an hour plus health insurance. Uh, Terry McDonald, uh, who's the executive director of, of St. Vincent's in Eugene and I, will not work on a project if the business plan shows it could not afford at least $14 an hour plus health insurance. Um, it's not a wage that's going to make you rich, but it's not minimum wage, and if you have health insurance, your family has some degree of economic security. Um, <clears throat> the way uh, 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 Terry uh, and, and I work together is uh, we, oh, I, I should say this. Um, his assistance to uh, nonprofits, he will only work with nonprofits, churches, uh, community development corporations, youth groups, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> he has grants from national foundations that have given him money to replicate his businesses, and because uh, he, each of the material is a separate business, um, to replicate them on the East Coast. Uh, uh, he's worked in Orlando, Atlanta. Um, uh, we we uh, got a, a, a mattress recycling plant uh, opened in Bridgeport in June of this past year, and we're 
excuse me, we're working on a couple of others in, in different states. Uh, he's uh, helping groups in Chattanooga. Uh, we're starting to work in Baltimore. He's, we're working in Newark, uh, New Jersey together. Um, and um, the way the process works is this. If your community uh, is, if you like this concept, uh, I need um, to work with representatives of your community, uh, either elected officials or public officials or just citizens. Um, I need to set up a conference call with nonprofits that are interested in operating a business. The purpose of this whole program is for nonprofits to operate a business which will give them a surplus called profit, if you were for profit business, that allows them to continue their nonprofit mission, whatever that is. That's the whole goal of this program. And um, uh, not all nonprofits are, are, uh, uh, good, uh, are a good match because many nonprofits have never run a business, have never dreamed of running a business, but m some uh, have. And we manage to find in each city we go to, uh, whether it's the Orange Grove Center, uh, which is a, a, a very uh, well-respected group in Chattanooga. They've had the contract to do recycling for the city for maybe 15, 20 years. And they're interested in expanding their recycling program to, let's say, clothing. Uh, and uh, so Terry is, is helping them. Um, I usually am the first screen, although it doesn't work that way all the time, to talk to these groups, to, to sort of screen them, to see if, one, if they're interested, two, if I think they have the capability. At that point, if I think they do, we set up a conference call with Terry, and uh, if that conference call goes well and uh, where we all think there's a, a road forward, uh, he just schedules to stop in that city when he makes his East Coast swings, usually from the south up to the north. Uh, uh, you know, he would st on one trip, he'll stop in in Reading, Pennsylvania, where we're working on three co of his companies, uh, and then go to Baltimore, Newark. It's, uh, we're, we're a little denser up there than you are down here, so the cities are close together. Um, and that's the process. Uh, Terry's time and travel money is picked up by uh, his foundation grants, specifically for him to replicate these businesses for nonprofits on the East Coast. And uh, his latest grant, um, actually, he has a sort of a bank of capital that he can help leverage uh, financing for a nonprofit to start the financing uh, operation. I help in the sense of working with the nonprofit on their business plans and on finding capital in the nonprofit sector from foundations to individual donors. And because Terry works for large, uh, well-known national foundations, when local foundations know that he's working they almost always are oriented toward matching his money because they want to be at the table and they, they want to have their fingerprints, as they say, on, on this project. And this has worked uh, well in, in Bridgeport and in, it's working well in Reading. In both those cities, the cities themselves, even though they're poor cities, have used some of their CDBG monies, community block grant monies, which every community gets from, uh, from the feds based on population and poverty rates. Um, so uh, we literally pieced together the financial scenario to get the business off the ground. Um, uh, I, I, I gave a list of most of the types of businesses he operates, but uh, he also has micro-businesses. For instance, uh, he's made a product, a fire-starting product, out of old crayons. Uh, he just, as Terry says, I'm quoting Terry, you show me a lot of everything that's uniform, homogeneous, and I could make an enterprise out of it. And that's what he does. Uh, uh, I, I, I didn't. I think. Oh, I mentioned earlier today uh, that he developed a little business in window pane glass. You can't mix window pane glass with bottle glass. The chemistry just doesn't work. So he's developed a little. Um, I don't know what you call it. A little furnace out of scrap material. He melts down the pane glass and he manufactures awards, trophies, statues that you might give out uh, at, at an event, and he sells them nationally. So virtually every, uh, again, if he has a homo enough of a homogeneous material, he can develop an enterprise. <clears throat> He's also, I should say they are also, uh, logistics uh, experts. Um, he, has, he has a truck, the St. Vincent de Paul has a trucking company which ships end product all the way up to Portland from Eugene and all the way down to LA in the south. And the trucks deliver product and they're empty coming back, so they bring in raw material back to Eugene. He's actually, they have actually developed uh, this, uh, uh, this logistics exchange uh, with uh, community groups in, 
Italy, Brussels, and uh, Italy, Belgium, and uh, UK. Uh, in those countries, old, bulky furniture is considered junk and it goes to landfills. Uh, Terry recognized this, that if they're refurbished, they will sell very well in Eugene. So he uses his logistics um, uh, uh, skills to bring this, uh, products to the, to the United States by boat and then rail to Eugene, fixes up, uh, repairs the uh, products, sells it, and splits the profit 50-50 with the community groups in Europe. Uh, so not only is he an ingenious business person, uh, but he is, uh, uh, I should keep on saying he, I should say they, are uh, very good neighbors, if you will. Uh, they are not imperialists. Uh, they don't keep all the money for themselves. Um, okay, um, so um, let me get to the last category. I don't have a clock in front of me, but I, I know my 40 minutes is, is winding down. Let me just talk about the organ so a couple of the organics companies, uh, which may be of interest. And all of these, I think, uh, can find a home here in, um, in, Hen in excuse me, in Brevard County. Um, excuse me, Transylvania County, I apologize. Um, uh, uh, given you know, the, uh, the need for uh, topsoils in, in the area and the need to find a better way of handling your organic waste. Uh, some of you, I know that uh, Transylvania County does have a mulching operation, which is great. Uh, the next step is to deal with your food waste. And the, the, the next step has to start with the private sector or large generators of food. Uh, 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 supermarkets, your you have Ingalls down here. Uh, we don't have them up north, but we have Walmart and Whole Foods, etc. These, the, these big companies, Kroger's, for example, uh, Publix, their disposal method of choice is composting, only because it's cheaper. They are not environmentalists, although they like that label. Uh, it's because it's cheaper. As I was saying earlier, a company opened a year and a half ago in Wilmington, uh, Delaware, uh, Peninsula, compost company, 21 acres. They're handling about 150,000 tons a year of uh, food waste from these large groceries. Uh, and um, they are expanding. I don't know how much they could go further on 21 acres, but they're hoping to double what they're currently doing to about 300,000 tons a year. And <clears throat> as I understand it from uh, the, the owner of the company, Nelson Wydell, they priced their tipping fee, because when these companies tip their food waste, they have to pay to get rid of it, just like a landfill or any other disposal facility. He prices his tip fee uh, 10, 15 percent below the, the landfill. So naturally, uh, the big companies would like to take a 10 or 15 percent uh, savings, and they deliver the material. Um, other large generators are, of course, military bases, hospitals, uh, prisons, um, uh, 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 restaurant chains, um, uh, they uh, can all, uh, th that's where you go to get your material because you will be paid a tip fee and then of course you will be paid for your end product. And your end product of course could be topsoil, compost, but some companies uh, do more than that. Um, uh, one company, Blessing uh, Greenhouse and Compost Facility, takes its uh, top beautiful black topsoil which they age for a year or two and they put it in their greenhouse and grow flowers and sell the flowers. They are adding value to a compost. Compost uh, in my part of the country, the mid-Atlantic, uh, good finished compost may go for uh, $20 uh, a cubic yard. Uh, flowers go for several thousand dollars a cubic yard. Uh, so the value added is quite obvious. Um, and um, as I was saying before, the company was so attractive that the state regulator quit his job and is now working for Mr. Blessing. Uh, who's the site manager. Um, and it, it's, it's a fascinating company. Uh, most of their products, uh, feedstock, uh, are chicken waste, dead chickens and chicken manure and chicken bedding. Uh, the eastern shore where they're located uh, of Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware is chicken heaven, if you will. Uh, actually, it's chicken hell, knowing uh, how these, uh, it's heaven for the, for the companies, hell for the chickens. Um, and his, his formula is 50%, you know, the chicken junk, and 50% shredded yard debris. Uh, and that's his formula. He gets beautiful compost. And as I said, he just started selling compost about a year ago called Blessing Blends, Blessings Blend of Topsoil. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, so that, that's an, uh, it's a concept that can easily be replicated. 
obviously you have to have a greenhouse and you have to want to and know how to grow flowers. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's very important for value added. The, the name of the game for recycling is value added. If you recycle your glass and paper and ship it out of town, it's okay. But the real, what I call the pot of gold at the end of, gar of the garbage rainbow is taking that material locally and making a valuable product out of it so the profits stay local, taxes are local, jobs are local, etc. Plus you avoid paying to put it in the landfill. Um, the last company I'd like to talk about in this area is um, uh, Bioponica. Uh, uh, again, all these companies have web pages. It's Bioponica, Bioponica com. They're based in Atlanta. And what they do is um, they're, they're uh, in a warehouse. They built a uh, facility which is probably from the, the fruit chairs to here, and just about this size right here. Uh, initial cost is $5,000. It's extremely cheap. It's perfect for nonprofits because it's, it's a no-brainer to get $5,000 from a foundation or an individual donor to invest in what I call, it's not technically true, I call it a perpetual growing machine. What they do is they, from compost, they grow algae and duckweed, which is not very sophisticated. They process it easily and feed it to fish. Uh, there, are, there are two levels. Uh, the bottom level are where the fish are. They get fed by the algae and the uh, duckweed. Their waste is cycled to a mezzanine above, which becomes the nutrition for plants. And um, uh, one of the advantages, uh, the first, uh, the city of Atlanta bought the first two units as part of their outdoor science uh, program in the parks. And the second sale, I, I may not have been the second, I think it was the second, I introduced them to the City of Refuge. The City of Refuge is a remarkable institution. It's located in, in a very depressed uh, section of Atlanta. Uh, it's a, it's a fenced-in compound of maybe five to eight acres, I, I don't know exactly, and it's a shelter for 200 women and children. And uh, in the facility, uh, there's housing, of course, uh, but there's also medical facilities, dental facilities, uh, mental health facilities, education facilities, gymnasium. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a protected world for uh, women who need, uh, need help. Uh, and, their, and their kids. And they serve 20,000 meals per month to uh, both people who l live in the shelter and uh, uh, people outside, uh, around 10,000 people who live outside the community. So uh, they put together, they built a greenhouse, it's producing now. Um, women have been, tra uh, adults have been trained uh, to work in the greenhouse, which is a training for a good career. The these are good jobs. Um, and they are what we call uh, import substitution. Instead of buying food from the outside of their compound, they're growing a good bit of food themselves, which of course saves them money. Uh, and then they added an innovation that I don't think anyone has, has thought of. As you know, in uh, our major uh, cities, there are such things called food deserts, meaning uh, it's impossible to get good, fresh food at reasonable prices. In uh, some places like East Detroit, people get their groceries from gas stations. And, they're paying high, quali uh, high price for low quality. So um, what th they've done in the city of refuge is after they started producing, they uh, uh, built, uh, not built, they got a food truck. And now they go out in the community and they sell fresh fish and fresh food at reasonable prices. It's a way of breaking what, as I said, sociologists call the food desert in our urban areas. Um, and there, that's a, a perfect uh, um, educational a facility for colleges, uh, junior colleges, uh, high schools even, perhaps even uh, middle schools, uh, where you could start teaching people, first of all, about food and how dangerous food can be if you have all this stuff in it, which unfortunately we can't get rid of. Uh, it's such a serious problem <clears throat> that some of the food composters I know, Greenway, uh, Greenway, which is another good company up in Poughkeepsie, New York, they will not sell compost made from food waste to people who want to use it to grow food because it's contaminated. They sell the product for highway, for landscaping, etc., but they will not risk selling that material for someone they know is going to use it to grow food. That's how, unfortunately, our, uh, contaminated our food system is. Um, but to get back to, um, oh, I, let me say one other thing about Greenway. They are also perfecting a system for us in Reading. We've hired them through the city. I, I'm a, I work for the city of Reading. Um, 
to set up a, a, a pilot program to show how food waste and their sewage sludge can be co-composted, which will save them a, a great deal of money uh, from composting the food sludge as opposed to paying about $100 a ton to get rid of it in a landfill. Um, and uh, we, we love working with Reading because every time uh, we uh, can show a savings, uh, the mayor has decided to take those savings and invest it in the city workers. Uh, so uh, we, we like that cycle of saving money from disposing garbage and investing in, in worker quality uh, and, and good working conditions. Um, one last company I'm going to mention, Growing Power. It's both a for-profit and a non-profit. Uh, it's based in Milwaukee. And I would say they are the premier uh, greenhouse, community greenhousing company in the country. And they train people. Uh, you go to Milwaukee and spend internships and such with them. And a lot of uh, other companies are based on what they've learned at Growing Power. So uh, those are some of the best uh, composting companies. There are many, happily, across the country. But I think um, for a nonprofit, as I said before, uh, these types of, of companies uh, can help uh, with education, but also with dealing with food problems, etc. cetera. Um, OK. Um, let me end by saying that things are, are really uh, very ripe for this to happen uh, in the county. You have a relatively high tip fee of about 50 bucks a ton, which will attract people who can take advantage of charging lower than that and, and, and getting their money. Um, there's not much composting going on, so in a sense it's virgin uh, territory, although in neighboring Henderson County there is a compost company, which is great. Uh, we don't want to put you out of business, but you might want to locate here as well. <laughs> okay, um, and um, uh, also, your, several North Carolina cities have pioneered in what is called the pay-as-you-throw system, uh, which means that uh, if I'm neighbors with this gentleman and he recycles and composts in his backyard and puts out one bag of garbage a week and I don't care about anything and I throw out everything and I have five garbage, five garbage bags a week, I pay for garbage five times more than he does. Uh, it's obviously an economic incentive system, uh, which works. 7,000 uh, cities across the country use pay-as-you-throw, called P-A-Y-T. Uh, and there's a wonderful web page established by US EPA um, called paytnow.org, where you could get the histories of hundreds, of, if not thousands, of cities that have uh, implemented pay-as-you-throw, and I wish I could remember the name of the North Carolina city, which was one of the first uh, in the area to implement pay-as-you-throw. And as we learned today from uh, county officials, there is a form of pay-as-you-throw uh, by pre-purchasing bags uh, for garbage. Uh, the key is to make sure the differential between the recycler and the composter and the slob uh, is significant. When pay-as-you-throw was uh, introduced in Fresno, California years ago, the differential was $5 a month, and very few people paid attention to it. When it was then implemented a few years later in um, Seattle, the differential was $17 a ton. People started recycling. Um, so um, there, there are a lot of uh, ripe uh, things here. Also, uh, you're in a very unusual uh, uh, company, uh, county because um, I'm sure you all know uh, that People for a Clean Mountain has convinced the county commissioners to put a one-year moratorium, which I believe is a month old or something like that. Um, so you can think about these things. So you could plan for the future. Uh, we are very skeptical of burning garbage. The price is very, very high, two or three times as high as any other form of disposal. Um, and um, there, are, there are technology questions. I am not uh, an emissions expert, although uh, we work with them. Uh, we focus on the economic analysis. And just let me end with this last story, and we could take questions and talk about how these things might happen in the county. Um, there's a county uh, 30, 40 miles north of Washington, D.C., called Carroll County, C-A-R-R-O-L-L, -L, County, Maryland. Very conservative county. Um, they signed on to a garbage incinerator with neighboring Frederick County. And the citizens of Frederick, uh, excuse me, of Carroll County uh, didn't think the incinerator made sense. This was a traditional mass burn incinerator. And um, they started pl plugging out the numbers of what this thing is going to cost. And the cost was so astronomical, and the contract terms were so 
uh, disadvantageous to the county, meaning the company and the state agency had all the power, collected all the money, and got all the benefits, whereas the people got a tax increase. They wasn't called a tax increase because this is a conservative county, and they wouldn't get elected if they called it a tax increase, so it's called a service fee. And the service fee will be from, would be uh, from about 200 to $400 per household plus businesses would get a surcharge as well. Well, the county, the citizens of the county formed a group, I think it's called Zero Waste Carroll County, and they presented the financial picture of what this facility will do for the county and the next generation of taxpayers. And the county backed out of the deal at the cost of $3 million. Uh, the contract said if they back out, they would have to pay a penalty of $3 million. The county commissioners voted to segregate $3 million in case they had to pay they may want to fight it in, in court because the company may not have been uh, presented all the full information and if you don't disclose all the full information the contract could be voided. I, I don't know much more about that, I'm certainly not a lawyer. The point is a very conservative group of politicians, elected officials, looked at the numbers and decided that incineration was a very bad investment. Uh, Frederick County is pursuing it. Uh, their citizens formed No Incineration Frederick and uh, there's a battle. It's going, been going on for eight years, and it, uh, I don't know the outcome. Uh, but um, my point in this is that <clears throat> whether you are worried about emissions or not, um, the financial threat is a very real threat uh, if you build an incinerator. Uh, uh, for any number of reasons, um, you may have read about Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which uh, just about went bankrupt because their incinerator didn't work, and uh, there are a couple of other uh, stories like that. Uh, but even if they do work as they do in uh, neighboring Montgomery County, which is the neighbor to these other counties, they have to be subsidized. We found out through uh, Freedom of Information uh, requests that the 71% of the revenue to support the plant comes from taxpayers, not from energy sales, not from tip fees. So these things are massive subsidies. And um, uh, we think they should be avoided. And we know that a county, certainly a county like you have here, that has a very wealthy uh, storehouse of landfill space. You've got 17 years of permitted landfill space. And then you have land surrounding that where you can get further uh, permitted uh, space if you need it. Uh, and as we discussed earlier this afternoon, if you start now in two or three years, you could double that 17 years because you could easily double your current recycling rate with some of the programs that are going on across the country. Uh, using economic incentives, there are private sector companies that offer incentives. There's a wonderful company based in Michigan called Rewards for Recycling. They actually give you coupons that you could turn in for cash in your local stores and in your you know, chain stores uh, just because you participate in recycling once a month. Uh, and, of course, I, I'll be happy to connect you uh, to that company. Uh, they're based in Traverse City, uh, Michigan. Uh, and they've got about, uh, oh, actually there's an article coming out which I'll send people uh, in BioCycle magazine about them, which I can forward to uh, Diane and she can spread to, to everyone here that's interested. So the message is that th uh, what I'm talking about is state of the art. It's not futuristic. It's happening. It's happening in the private sector. Uh, obviously with public participation, uh, but these are not uh, things that are going to happen in a few years. These are things that are happening right now, and you folks uh, in the county here uh, can certainly take advantage of it. I found out that Henderson County has no landfill capacity. They're shipping to South Carolina. Certainly they should be looking at things like this, but I was invited to Transylvania County, so <laughs> who cares about Henderson County? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, any questions, comments? Yes, miss. Yeah. Are there any places this small yes. where things are working where you don't have to import any feedstock? Uh, that's a good question. There is a wonderful example of citizen planning and solid waste authority planning in the a county called Del Norte County, California. It's spelled N-O-R-T-E. We, they pronounce it North. Uh, and about, I'm going to guess, five years ago, they were close to running out of landfill space. And the closest, next closest landfill was 82 miles away. Shipping garbage 82 miles is very expensive. Uh, it's the workers 
on the truck going back and forth waiting at the landfill. So they started an intensive um, recycling program. They called it a zero waste program, which some people prefer that uh, uh, title. I, I think it's, uh, it's questionable because uh, the concept has been diluted so much. Incineration companies say they're zero waste. Recycling plus incineration equals zero. Uh, recycling, composting, and incineration equals zero waste. Uh, the, it's, it's so convoluted. I, I talk about recycling and economic development or total recycling. Um, that is a, co a county with 35,000, maybe a little less. Very rural county, very large rural county, very similar uh, in numbers to here. Obviously, the, the, the terrain is different. And um, uh, that their, planning pro their plan is on the web page. Just go to the uh, Solid Waste Authority of Del Norte County, and you could, you could pick it up. The plan is about four years old. I was on the team of about eight people who helped plan it. Uh, so that's, that, that's a very good model. Uh, and uh, again, the people who implemented that are solid waste professionals. Uh, so it's not community groups saying you should do this. It's the authority that's actually doing it. Um, there, there are other uh, uh, rural uh, uh, models. Uh, there's a wonderful group uh, in southern Ohio that serves uh, four states in that corner uh, area called Rural Action. And they have a, also another zero waste program where they, um, what they did, and I, their reports are available, ruralaction.org, uh, it's a nonprofit. Um, what they did was they serve an eight, uh, maybe a 10 county area in these other states, in all of these states. And they found that in each of the counties that they were, their target area, they had an excellent program. One in uh, buyback, buying back recyclables from people, one in composting, one in source reduction. And they surveyed this, and they have case studies of each county. And now they are trying to bring the best of each county to every county. It's a wonderful strategy. It's more a regional strategy than a county strategy. But um, uh, the director there is Michelle Decker, uh, D-E-C-K-E-R. She's a very exper experienced nonprofit uh, uh, executive director. And uh, they share information uh, all over the place. So those, those two counties, Del Norte County and rural action, which serves several rural counties, I would say are, are the best models uh, to go to. And do those create additional jobs, those programs? Yes, the per, the, it's recycling and economic development. Uh, they are very conscious of the fact uh, that um, uh, recycling creates many jobs. My, uh, my colleague, Brenda Platt, at the Institute uh, did a study about seven years, eight years ago, uh, which documented, it was based on interviews of about 115 recycling companies. Every 10,000 tons of garbage sent to a landfill or an incinerator creates one job. Every 10,000 tons of material that's recycled creates five to 10 jobs in processing and then hundreds of jobs as the material goes to agriculture and industry. The most labor intensive recycling uh, industry we found uh, was computer recycling and refurbishing. Every 10,000 tons of computers that are refurbished, recycled, uh, creates 296 jobs. And uh, my, uh, Brenda just completed a new study for the state of Maryland on the jobs tons ratio for composting. Uh, and those, uh, you could go to our webpage and get that report. Uh, Diane Harl has, has I, we already sent it to her. And um, uh, Brenda calculated with, uh, with Bobby Bell, uh, her assistant, um, <clears throat> that comprehensive composting in the state of Maryland would create 1,400 jobs in the processing of the, of the organics and in the landscaping companies and so on and so forth that uh, grounds management that use, uh, use the end product. So the, the jobs accumulate in processing and in the private companies that buy the material and they, that supports employment. Uh, uh, there are a very, that's a very interesting study. There are good statistics in it and uh, uh, you, obviously you could look at it. We, we do not charge for any of our reports and we just throw them up on the, on the internet. Yes, miss. Do these companies bring any of their own employees, or is it strictly where they come, they employ the locals? Uh, uh, the, the latter. Um, obviously, there are managers and engineers that may not be in the area, although this part of the country, you've got tons of engineers, so uh, they may not need to bring their engineers from Canada. To set up the company, they will bring their engineering staff. Uh, but all the jobs in the factory are recruited locally. In fact, uh, there's a labor shortage in Edmonton. 
because it's a boom town. And when we started negotiating in the Reading, when we thought we were on the fast track, we're on the medium track right now, um, uh, Mr. Alowell, you wanted to bring up 40 workers to train them in his factory and send them back to Reading to work. And the mayor was, of course, thrilled because it's 40 good jobs. And uh, Reading, Pennsylvania is the sixth poorest city in the country. Two years ago, they were the poorest city in the country. That's population divided by income. Uh, there are other ways of measuring poverty, but uh, it's uh, obviously it's a very poor uh, city. And of course, uh, the mayor wants 120 industrial jobs in, in the city. Uh, and the first 40, uh, the plan was to get them trained. That's been delayed because the, the implementation of the plant has been de delayed. Uh, we, uh, I better not say this because I'm being taped. Uh, there were <laughs> problems arose, uh, and we're dealing with them. Uh, much the same as you're, you're dealing with problems in trying to build a compost company. Sir. Uh, you said at the start that the secret is to separate the trash in the first place. Keep it separated, yes. And do you have, can you talk at all about how a county, say like ours, which does a little bit of uh, separation, mm -hmm. how mechanically or, or politically you go about having that separation happen? Sure. There, and then, and then mm -hmm. a, subsidiary question. Mm -hmm. The outfit that wanted to build this uh, what I call trash burner here was going to spend a couple million dollars to bring in a big plant that was going to take trash and separate it. Yes. And, and it sounds to me like that is fraught with a lot of difficulties in keeping things clean and things like that. You got so it. Can uh, you address Those jobs are the worst jobs you could imagine. It's standing on a conveyor belt picking stuff. Uh, there, there's, a, there's an incredible story. In Los Angeles, they have a system like that, and they pay minimum wage, mostly to Latino and Latino, Latina and Latino workers. Temporary work, no security, uh, you know, no working conditions, nothing. Uh, a couple hundred miles north of San Francisco, same job is unionized, 20 bucks an hour, plus health benefits. So the range is tremendous, but picking, even picking materials from a recycling line, which there's no garbage, it's just plastic and glass and you have to pick and separate. Uh, those are terrible jobs. I, believe me, I worked uh, on, uh, in, <laughs> the reason how I learned uh, my, uh, my aunt's business was working on the assembly line. She figured uh, if I was gonna take over the business, which I eventually didn't, uh, I'd have to start at the bottom. And <laughs> that's where I was on an assembly line. It's, uh, you know, it's a type of job you need marijuana to get through the day. Uh, uh, <laughs> Or your drug of choice. Uh, you could also go drink something. Um, but the point. How, how does the county go about getting its trash well, separated okay. in the first place? All right. Well, um, you already have a source separation system. I don't know exactly how it works, but in the city and county, there there are different systems, and you uh, people have uh, rolling car bin uh, rolling carts that they put all their recyclables in, called single stream, mixing all the recyclables together. That is uh, taken. Uh, to a processing plant. Uh, it may be done at your landfill. I, we, we talked to the operator from the county today. I, I didn't get all the details. And then, because North Carolina has great markets, looks like someone there knows more about this than I do. No. Did you want, oh, I thought you were, okay. When you get done, I have a problem. Great, okay. Um, uh, what we learned from the gentleman whose name I forget that we met today, uh, uh, there, the markets in North Carolina are terrific. North Carolina is a very good recycling state. You've got paper mills. Uh, uh, things like that. Um, uh, carpet mills in Georgia you could send your plastic to. And uh, he uses, at this point, a broker, a recycling broker. And the materials go to the broker and the broker sells it and there's some kind of revenue sharing. Um, there are two best ways to get people in households to recycle. One, make it mandatory, which you guys down here think is a communist plot, so that's not gonna happen. Uh, in New England and the West Coast, it's happening. Uh, but that's okay. You don't want communists to take over the recycling program. Um, the other is direct economic incentives. And as I, I mentioned, two forms. One is the pay-as-you-throw system, which is terrific. And then there's a company like Recycle Bank or Rewards for Recycling, which literally will pay up to $400 a year to your households who recycle. They're, they have different approaches. I won't go into them. Uh, you could look up both companies, and your officials can see if they want to bring them in or not. Um, so it's economic incentives or the law. Worcester, uh, Massachusetts, about, I don't know, 10 years ago, implemented mandatory recycling 
and pay as you throw, their recycling level jumped to 50% in one year uh, from a very low rate. I don't know the starting rate. But we do have a case study. Uh, Brenda, my colleague, uh, has 30 or 40 case studies that we did for the EPA on the best recycling and best composting cities and counties in the country. That information is on our webpage. It's out of date because EPA has hadn't, hasn't had money in about 10 years to focus on this. Uh, but the case studies are very good to show how a city manager got involved in recycling and how the program moved forward. Um, to, to, if I could just finish this. Some cities have been very innovative. The city of Toronto, Canada, has developed a system that, that is saving a good deal of money. Um, they have a garbage truck that they split in two, so they could pick up two different things at the same time. One week, they'll pick up your food waste from the household and your recycling, and they take it off and gets processed. They wash out the truck. The second week, they pick up food waste and garbage. And people don't mind keeping their garbage for two weeks because there's no food in it. It doesn't stink. It's not icky. Uh, by doing that, they have cut down the trucks going by your house from three to one per week. Uh, if you go to LA or San Francisco, three trucks go by your house a week. Uh, green, uh, the green bin is for yard debris that's picked up. A black bin is uh, garbage. And the blue bin is recycling. That's three trucks, three drivers, three tr uh, you know, it's very expensive. Most, the cost of most garbage systems are the labor, about 60, 70%. Obviously, you have trucks and gas and, and things like that. So, um, so and, and collection technology is improving all the time. And cities, a couple of cities are going after food waste. 150 cities in the country are now collecting food waste from households. It's the last thing you ever want to do because it's the most expensive. When you start your composting, you want to work with the private sector, the large generators, build up your systems, and then you could expand to household uh, material. And even before that, you want to give incentives for households, if they have the land, to do their composting themselves. Uh, backyard composting is zero waste. It evaporates from the waste stream forever. Uh, it's roughly 15% of a household's garbage. You, you eliminate 15% of your waste. Plus, you teach your kids about worms and, and bugs. My kids went to the science fair finals in DC with worms. Uh, my daughter. Uh, had three worm bins, bread, vegetables, and fruit. And she concluded at the age of five or six that worms like fruit more than they like bread because it disappeared first. <laughs> All kinds of things. Uh, a compost pile in your backyard is great for kids, both philosophy as well as science. I guarantee it. If your kids are a little older, tell them if they study garbage in school and college, they will never be unemployed. <laughs> Sir, you had a, 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 a you had a comment, and then this uh, young lady. Since Sir, I've heard it mentioned a couple of times about the biomass plant being subsidized. This is the interest in a full and honest disclosure. All renewable energy is subsidized. Yes. So just so everybody's really informed of that, it's not it's not it doesn't make the biomass any more evil or less evil, but it's all subsidized. Mm -hmm. And it is true, based on my research, that biomass is the worst way to recycle. Uh, material and create energy. So, but your information is very good. <clears throat> yeah. um, again, I, I'm not uh, an environmental scientist. I'm just focused on the costs. And I, and I don't know the particulars of the, the proposal that was here. Right. Perhaps Ned can add some information on that. Well, essentially, the gentleman's correct. The, the, by and large, all the energy strategies and policies do have some sort of an incentive, some sort of a, a program. You talk to solar, wind, and so on. Yeah. But as a general rule, renewable clean energies, and, and, and this is not including the biomass itself, but solar and wind are subsidized at about 10% of the rate that fossil fuels yeah. and others are. So it's apples and oranges. It's yeah. true everything is subsidized, but if you've got 90 million for one and you've got 9 million for the other, yeah. where, where's well, your what, What's thing? happening in, in the states, and also at the federal level, is that burning garbage in any technology is being considered a renewable energy. And therefore, they get renewable energy credits, which are worth $40 per kilowatt hour. That's an incredible subsidy. Um, and um, we fight this. In fact, we just had a victory in Arizona. The, the judge threw it out. They will not allow uh, burning garbage to be, get the energy credit. Um, and the insidious part is, as, as Ned imp implied, these systems cost so much. Again, I don't know the numbers for what was proposed here. 
that they literally divert into a bad, what I consider a bad technology, destroying materials from wind and solar, which are good because the energy credits have a, a limit to them. So if you give, uh, as, as Ned said, a ton of money to the garbage burning, there's less money for wind and solar. And, and, and hydro and, and other uh, really clean, uh, nothing is clean because even when you make photovoltaic cells, there's obviously an environmental cost to that. It's all relative. Uh, but uh, the point is well taken that all uh, renewable energy is subsidized. Uh, some, some countries do it better than others. In Germany, it's subsidized, but the photovoltaics belong to the people who put them on their houses. In the United States, that's too socialistic, so we want a big corporation to do it and charge us. Uh, so it's a question of owning your electric plant or paying someone else to do it. Uh, obviously, we like the, the German system of subsidizing households, not subsidizing dual power or one of the other local energy companies. Um, Miss, you, you had another question. Well, I, I, I actually just wanted a clarification. When you talked about mandatory uh, recycling, what yes. did you mean by that? Did you mean deposit systems? Or? No, uh, the, that would, the, we like deposit systems, although forget about it for North Carolina. Uh, but uh, meaning politically, it's, it's virtually impossible. Uh, but um, no, what I meant is the law of the city is that you have to recycle. And if you don't recycle, you will get fined. The first time, they'll give you a notice. The second time, the fine will be $25. The third time, will be 100 and so on. San Francisco and a couple of other cities require businesses mandatory to recycle. And San Francisco is unique. It's a unique city, unique people there. Um, uh, man, uh, food composting is mandatory from households mm -hmm. and businesses. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's an unusual city. Uh, you won't get the support for that here, obviously. But there are still, uh, uh, talking about mandatory in the South is okay. like talking union. I just wasn't South. sure. <laughs> I, no, no, I, just, I actually just didn't know if that's what you meant by it, if yeah. it was deposit no, or not. It's so. making it the law of, yeah. of your city okay. or county. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we advise not fining people unless they're you know, right. egregious because you don't want to alienate people for right. recycling. You, you want them to participate. Mm -hmm. And that's why the pay-as-you-throw system is so idea. nice, particularly okay. if it's mandatory and pay-as-you-throw. But we think pay-as-you-throw will get you where you want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, Seattle uh, doesn't have mandatory. They have pay-as-you-throw. They're one of the highest recycling cities. I think they're at just below 65 yeah. or 70 yeah. uh, percent. Uh, recycling yeah. numbers, like garbage numbers, are all fungible. Uh, there's nothing concrete about them. EPA doesn't even know how much garbage we have. The estimate is 250 tons. BioCycle does a survey. I think it's 350 tons. There's, no, there's virtually no way to check because uh, there's a, what do you call it, an informal economy around garbage, as well as other things in this country that you just can't, you can't get every, every ounce or every dollar calculated. Um, th uh, we did not talk about construction and demolition waste. If EPA thinks there's 250 million tons of garbage, household garbage, and business garbage a year, there's also another 250,000 tons of construction and demolition waste, which for some reason EPA does not count as municipal waste. But it's there and you have to deal with it. And there too, um, uh, uh, companies are making more money recycling C&D than putting it in the ground. And the, the, just the markets are working that way. Because the cost of disposal continues to go up. And, the more the cost of disposal goes up, the easier it is to, for recycling business to start recycling. Um, so the, the numbers are really impossible to match. Uh, the number is thrown out that the people, cities, counties, private people pay $75 billion a year for solid waste services a year, which is a large chunk of the economy. To balance that, let me point out that the garbage in the recycling industry, excuse me, recycling and composting and reuse industry is, in this country is larger than the automobile industry. Over a million jobs, 65,000 companies, uh, $235 billion of annual sales. That figure is from 2001. I, I don't know the estimates. I assume it's long. It's been 12 years. I assume it's higher. That's a pretty big accomplishment for a country that, in, when the Institute got started, the national recycling rate was 5%. Uh, so it's taken 40 years, but uh, the U.S. recycling movement is an incredible, diverse, a racially mixed, class mixed, uh, gender mixed uh, movement. Um, I did write a piece in 1995 summarizing what citizens did, uh, and I could forward that to you. It uh, was a, an article for an encyclopedia. But it's really perhaps the most successful uh, environmental, uh, uh, environmental movement in the country, uh, and our role was to make it both environmental and economic. 
Uh, sir? Yeah, you may have uh, said this, but uh, my wife and I, and we have two kids. We recycle the plastics, and what made a huge difference, and we do aluminum and uh, steel cans, and we do yard waste and all that. We got bears. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, food waste. So I don't, uh, what's made a big difference for us is you can throw everything in there now yes. with the plastics. I learned that today that they- Yes, they mega got, huge. Yeah. Mega huge. So we got a little county of 25, 30,000 people. How are we stacking up? Because I talked to the guys at the dump and they said what made a huge difference was we got a compactor for the cardboard. There's mega money in cardboard. And uh, uh, so they compacted, the, the biggest cost was hauling the cardboard up to Asheville the actual tr truck, driver, and diesel. Yeah. So how we compare? Well, first of all, driving, if your recycling market is what, Asheville is 20 miles away? Yeah. That's a very, 30 miles? That's a very close market. That's considered a local market. Well, he makes, because of the compactor, he does one run a week for the cardboard. Right. Versus three runs, uh, versus three ones. Because he can, you know. Yeah. Well, bad, well, yes. for your buck. well you, if you, I don't, I haven't, I, I shopped in Ingles, Ingles yesterday. Uh, I don't know how they operate, but in the Safeways and the big department stores in, in DC and New York, they all have compactors in the store to compact the corrugated to do exactly what you well, said. Well, these are all homeowners like me. So they have a compactor at the drop-off center right. for cardboard and plastics here in our little county. And I want to know how our county is faring against, you know, this is what you do. do you, you mean how your can, county stacks how we, yeah, up against other counties? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, how do we compare? Well, I, I heard... I might have missed that. You might no, have no, that. no, I did not address that. I heard today yeah. that your recycling rate in the county is about 32%. Um, someone can correct me if I, I got that wrong. It was mentioned at the meeting. Uh, the national average is about 35%. I think it's higher because uh, the national average does not count C and D. C and D is recycled much more than uh, r r garbage materials because it's so much easier. It's aggregated. It's in one spot, and so on. So um, you're you're doing almost as as well as the national average, which is nice. On the other hand, if you look at some of counties and cities across the country, you're not doing so well. No. They're at 70, 65, 70. Uh, San Francisco eight, claims 80 percent. You have to so take that. Into the ball. You're dropping in the ball. There's no, there's no food composting for all the large generators. Um, you're, you're, a lot of materials are leaking through because you're, you're, uh, you, you're, uh, you don't have mandatory. Your pay-as-you-throw system, which is not universal in the county, is, has a very small differential. Someone mentioned that you pay a buck, 50, a buck and a half for the bag, which is pretty cheap. And they don't weigh that bag. You could stuff whatever you know That's until true. the bag bursts. So there are efficiencies that could uh, that could, that could be implemented. But mostly, there's a lot of paper, plastic, and glass that's sl slipping through the system, uh, which is why uh, you know mandatory or pay as you throw or private sector companies giving incentives uh, has to be brought in. So we got to raise the rate on the bag. Is that what you're saying? Uh, that would help tremendously. I, I I don't know if you were here when I pointed out that when Fresno started tried. Pay as you throw their differential was five bucks a month. People, yeah, I heard that. Yeah, uh, you need a large differential to yeah. catch people's attention when they write out their checks every month for the. I, I don't know. Do people pay for private all this here? I know in the city. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's a combination of city uh, city collection. You folks obviously live in the county, not the city. Uh, so uh, yes, that would be a big step. Increasing the price of that that. So five bucks best. a bag versus a buck and a half would <clears> really do it. Yeah, yeah it would. There, there's a woman, this question came up uh, earlier today. She lives in North Carolina. She's the national expert on pay as you throw. Her name is Kristen Brown. She lives in Raleigh, I, I don't know. Whenever we have a problem with pay as you throw, we hire her. She's dynamite. I've been at meetings with her in Atlanta. Uh, I also heard about her meeting in DC. City officials raised these esoteric questions and off the top of her head, she said, well, this city over here solved that problem. This is how they did it. Uh, so she's she used she was the uh, pay as you throw uh, consultant. The negative for, to five bucks a bag is they're going to throw it in the river. That's right. That's the negative. Well, that's very interesting, and everybody asks that question. And Kristen has documented the fact that in the first stages of pay as you throw, you do get that, but over time it disappears. And also, uh, it's a police function. Uh, if someone throws a bag in the river, your garbage really tells. Pick up a bag of garbage, they know a lot about you just from 
reading your, your bills or whatever. Uh, so you, you know, in some cities, I uh, forget which, it's a county, has two police officers doing nothing but tracking illegal dumping we of all kinds. Excuse me, they're environmental enforcement officers. Miss. <laughs> yeah. Um, several things came up now. But originally, I was going to ask when you, if you do a city or a countywide composting, uh, how do other towns do that so that you're not going to get a lot of odor mm -hmm. and uh, you know we've got a lot of wild animals all living around us and uh, how do you stop all that from okay. uh, the rule of thumb is if your composting system smells you're not doing it right mm -hmm. uh, the, the technology has been perfected there are even in vessel systems where all the composting takes place in a big can the big metal can uh, but uh, the two things, proper management and buffer zones. Every compost system needs a wide buffer zone to keep it separate from households and businesses. Um, and those are the, the two main strategies. Well run with a buffer. And well run means you have a, 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 a slab, a cement slab or asphalt slab. Uh, best place for this would be at a closed cell of your landfill, which can't be used for much else anyway, but you could put the pad down there. If you put a building there, it will sink because it's a landfill. But if you put a pad there and operate there, there are regulations. We were talking about North Carolina state regulations. The purpose of my colleague Brenda Platt's report was to give a list of policies that the state needs to correct in order to, to, to encourage more composting. And that, those policies, I'm sure, would be uh, transfer. I mean, those policies would be relevant to North Carolina as well. But uh, the, one of the major uh, findings that Brenda had in this study of the state of Maryland was that you need two types of composting. You need large-scale composting to serve the metropolitan area because those large-scale uh, uh, composts can take meat because of the heat, the level heat. But you could do. But the other thing is the other part of what you need are community-scale composting next to community gardens or for landscaping, and that's where the jobs are better paid and the value added is higher than in a centralized facility. So Brenda's conclusion was that you need a combination of local composting. Uh, let's say uh, <clears throat> I, uh, your population is 35,000. You might have 10 or 15 small compost uh, operations, but you also need a, a larger one to serve uh, the products. For instance, um, uh, diapers. You certainly don't want to put a diaper in a community compost uh, project. You may be able to put a diaper into a large-scale system. And there's another technology, which I didn't mention, anaerobic digestion, uh, which means you, you put your food waste in a closed can, if you will, uh, and the methane, you tap the methane out and you get methane for uh, electricity. You could run your garbage trucks. In uh, Alachua County, Florida, they're planning an anaerobic digester just to, to fuel the garbage trucks. The county is in charge of, of garbage. And that could be liquid or, or um, solid uh, uh, natural gas. Uh, I may be using the wrong terminology. Uh, liquid uh, liquid uh, uh, natural gas. Um, uh, and the, it's all been done before. Um, you, you could uh, uh, go to Brenda's books, case studies of 30 or 40 small, Brenda did 30, 30 case studies. Small rural communities, the best, 10 best uh, rural recycling composting programs in the country, <coughs> small city, large city. So 30 case studies in all. Uh, and you could look at those case studies and see how those cities got started. Um, some got started by the private sector, some got started by the public sector. There's a myth uh, that the private sector tries to say that private sector does everything better than government. Just not true. There are good private sector companies, there are bad ones, there are good government programs, there are bad government programs. It depends on who's running the show. Um, so again, simulation comes from local officials who usually are prodded by people, people like you in this room, uh, and it's also prodded by private sector people who want to make money, but they want to make money in a way that's very acceptable to people in the community, because they're doing a service for the community, employing people, get, getting rid of organic matter in a very good way. That leads to more value added in your community. Uh, again, I'm not a compost expert, but we could, if, if, if there were compost questions that you had, I would be very happy to set up a, uh, what's it called, a Skype 
conference call with Brenda and Bobby Bell, who are our compost people, and just go back and forth on the technology. Uh, we, we use consultants as well. Craig Coker from Virginia is our anaerobic digestion um, uh, uh, consultant when we have uh, questions. And I gave out uh, this morning, and I'm sure Diane and PCM will distribute it, uh, a resource sheet with the names and addresses of many of the people I've mentioned uh, in the presentation. There are about 30 or 40. Oh, oh it's right here. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, you can just pick one up. And uh, uh, it, a lot of the people I mentioned, are their name and address is there. And there's this, actually a section on rural recycling. Another great rural recycling program is in the uh, Four Corners port, uh, part of Arkansas, the north west corner, I think it's Madison County, it's a public program that has set up recycling uh, satellites. They have a major processing center and they've got satellite centers all around uh, Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky, Bluegrass Recycling, a nonprofit, same thing, they call it a hub and spoke system where you've got a major processing facility and the materials are fed in by satellite uh, stations around the county or around the city. Uh, so again, um, I may not be able to articulate all of this, but we can lead you to the sources to uh, answer questions that may come up as you want to start implementing. Sir? Have you dealt with any projects that have dealt with hazardous waste and recycling, such no, as sir. batteries, such as uh, pharmaceuticals, no. light bulbs? No, and the reason is that uh, hazardous material, you can't get economic development out of hazardous material, you just want to contain it or get rid of it out of your community. However, there are new programs now that are dealing with pharmaceuticals and batteries and other products that have toxic material in it. It's called take back programs where cities and counties and states are requiring the manufacturers of batteries, pharmaceuticals and other products uh, and their distributors to take back the material once the consumer is done with it. And in California, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, these, we could get you these laws. Connecticut and Rhode Island and California in the last two weeks just passed a mattress take back law. Every uh, mattress company that distributes, mat uh, sells mattresses in those three states has to make arrangements to take back that mattress when it's ready for disposal. Um, and they could, uh, uh, the, 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 the term for it is extended producer responsibility. And it's worked extremely well with um, toxic materials as you suggested. Um, it remains to be seen how efficient it's run when they're getting into products that have markets. Uh, then, uh, then we don't want uh, the big computer companies to take charge of our recycled computers because they're gonna take them and shred them and sell the metal. We want those machines refurbished. We want the parts recovered. Uh, we want the uh, alloys recovered uh, if you can't recycle the part, reuse the part. Uh, these electronic scrap are so valuable as, as a metals or as working machines that we do not want the big companies to take them back and sell us new machines. We want to take advantage of refurbishing. Uh, and there are nonprofit groups that refurbish computers and make them available to low-income schools and community groups for 50 bucks a piece. And it's a way of getting very powerful technology in the hands of low-income people. Um, so there, there are program, take-back programs for the two uh, products you mentioned, and there probably will be more and more of that. I expect in five years every state to have a mattress take-back law. Um, obviously, each state may do it a little bit differently. Uh, but again, these things are coming. Uh, uh, most of them start in California and move east. In this particular case, it started in New England and is moving what south do you, What do you west. think about automobiles and washing machines? <laughs> they're, they're, they're ideal. Uh, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, like they, would uh, they run a program which is, which is ingenious. As you may know, if you donate your old car or boat to, um, to many of these groups, I won't mention any, they just turn it over to a broker. The broker moves it quickly, gets $100 or $200 a car, and the donor can, because of new IRS laws, can only claim a deduction of the one or two hundred dollars. What St. Vincent de Paul does, they have a whole car lot. They fix the car, they sell it for a thousand or two thousand dollars, and the donor gets a two thousand dollar credit. Uh, all because they train workers to repair and basically make those cars available to working families. Um, uh, one of the biggest, I, I believe, 
uh, the numbers are that uh, uh, St. Vincent de Paul's car lot brings in a million dollars a year uh, from, from the donation, repair, and resale. Um, the uh, um, uh, same thing with appliances. They, they are very clever. Um, when they refurbish a refrigerator, they, uh, first of all, if it, the refrigerator is real old and an energy guzzler, they just scrap it. But when they scrap it, they tap out the liquids, the Freon and the other liquids. That material is not being produced anymore. The price has gone from $5 a gallon to $25 gallon, a gallon in a couple of years. So they're, they are the, one of the largest suppliers of recycled uh, Freon and the other liquids in the refrigerators in the country. Uh, unfortunately, many if refrigerators are disposed of without tapping the gases and it becomes a horrible pollutant to the landfills as well as the incinerators, uh, as well as the atmosphere. My theory is if automobile manufacturers had to take back cars when you were done with them, they would rapidly figure out how to design them so they could rebuild them. It's exactly <laughs> what's happening in Europe. Is it? Uh, wow. re car manufacturers have to build so with recycling, future recycling in mind uh, for the same exact reason uh, you said. I'm, I'm sure you may have heard of uh, um, planned obsolescence, Vance Packard in the 1960s oh, yeah. writing about it. Uh, it's, unfortunately, it's part of our economy. We are encouraged to throw things away that are still useful. In fact, I just, uh, a book just came out called Garbology. Uh, uh, it's by a guy by the name of Humes, H-U-M-E-S. I think the book is half very good and half very bad. Uh, I'll only talk about the good part. I'll also send you my review if you want. Um, and um, the good part is that he gives a nice, concise 20 or 30 page history of the evolution of the American economy from a thrift economy back in the 1890s to a throwaway economy, which we've all been living with for the past, since the 60s. It's a, it's a, great, uh, it's a great section of his book. Uh, he also promotes incineration, which I disagree with, uh, but I, it's, worth, it's worth reading. Um, I understand that uh, if you want bulk sales, they'll give you a big discount, uh, but I'll, I'll be happy to send you my review. Um, I also suggest you get a movie, and it's available for free. Uh, if you're an environmental group, you could call up and get it for free. It's called Trashed. Uh, Trash, excuse me. Uh, now I forget. I think it's called Trash. You could look it up on the internet. It may even be on the internet, uh, on YouTube. And um, it's a shocking report of worldwide garbage, the worldwide garbage crisis, including plastic in the ocean, which is... Uh, they're, they're, the oceans are beyond redemption because the particles don't uh, disappear, they just get smaller and smaller. Plastic is, is of its nature, attracts other toxins, so you, this little piece of plastic becomes a little toxic pill that the fish eat. And they eat so much of the plastic, they starve to death. Uh, and it's, it's a, there's a wonderful book called Plastic Ocean by my friend Captain Charles Moore. Uh, that is a very depressing book, uh, 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 but uh, uh, just one statistic I remember, uh, the book, uh, well, he's been doing this for years, about five years ago, he found that in every ocean of the world, which he travels on his boat each year, um, there was six times more plastic scrap than plankton. Plankton, of course, wow. is the source of all life. He just did the study last year, it's now 20 times as much plastic as plankton in the ocean. And it's not recoverable because one, it's tiny pieces of plastic and also it dissolves into a film about one foot below the surface of every ocean is a plastic film. No one knows what to do with this. Uh, there are also these things called gyres. Have you heard about uh, the gyres? As big as the state of Texas in, every, in the Pacific Ocean at least. <clears throat> and uh, it's floating garbage. Just islands and islands of floating garbage. Every city in the country, whenever you see a piece of plastic on the street, eventually that will wind up in the ocean because it'll get into the creek, the river, and eventually the ocean. So um, no one knows how to solve this problem. Uh, it, it's quite depressing, um, particularly if we have grandkids and want to think about the future. It's a depressing uh, development, which uh, no one has an answer to, other than stop it as much as we can right now. Yes, miss. A couple of years ago, we, we got a new door, a front door, and the guy who came to put it in uh, is from one of the big home stores. Uh, we asked, I asked him, what do you do with the old door? 
and the, the surround mm -hmm. around it. And he said, oh, I've got this big container in my front yard, one of these huge, huge containers. He says, I fill one of those up every week. Mm -hmm. And, and takes it to the landfill. Take it to the landfill. Well, that and, is, and he does mm, windows as well, yeah. you know. That is a business person who is very stupid. Well, because, I think that might be the only way he knows what to do with Well, it. excuse me, I shouldn't have said that. He's <laughs> uninformed of how he can make more money. Let me put it that way. Uh, if you go, to, uh, uh, go on the web page, look for urbanore.com, or spelled O-R-E. It's one of the oldest uh, recycling companies in the country. Uh, since the recycling revolution in the late 60s. I would say, I don't know, the, uh, the single most um, profitable thing that they sell are old doors. And they sell them at about half the price that you would get for a, a door from a, from a, you know, a other type of business. Doors are very valuable. If they're hollow doors, they're worthless, meaning they're a frame with air in the middle and a piece of cardboard, almost, uh, making your door. If it's a solid door, it could be worth hundreds of dollars. If it's a solid door with ornate or antique type windows, it could be worth $500. You just need an infrastructure to gather them. You need to, uh, if, you, if you look, I don't know if it's on the webpage, but if you ever get to one of these stores, if you get to Baltimore, Second Chance does the same thing. Uh, you, you size them, you put them in categories, in bins, and people know they need a door of this size, they want wood, they want antique, they want brass. They just go through it and they, they move very quickly. Old, door, old, old solid doors move very, very quickly if you have the right presentation, like any merchandising, and if you have the right pricing. Uh, so um, I'd be very happy to talk to that gentleman and suggest he... Well, I think all the builders around here well, we uh, let's become consultants to them and make some money. <laughs> <laughs> or better yet, let's open up a door store. <laughs> um, but they're very, they're very valuable. And some of them you can't replace. Some of them are made out of redwood or uh, 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 spring, uh, Bruce. Uh, I forget all the names of the woods, but they're irreplaceable. You can't get that wood anymore. Yes, miss. Uh, about 20 years ago, I lived up on Nantucket Island and a small island 30 miles out Best of the city. Best community in the country. Back then, they had, it was illegal to bring styrofoam to the island. I love it. Um, <laughs> is it possible that a, a small county could make certain things illegal to have? Absolutely. Or to tax them? Or Absolutely. by offering alternatives? Yeah, or it, it's, uh, I, I know at least three cities that have banned uh, styrofoam from food service. Uh, uh, in fact, some cities ban all single, single, uh, single use uh, food service. Berkeley, Santa Monica, and, and not only in California. Um, banning polystyrene from food service is an essential thing for both solid waste management as well as public health. Because using these cups when you drink alcohol or hot stuff from a styrofoam cup, it leaches in your body, you get polystyrene. All of us have polystyrene. All of us have lots of ugly things in our bodies, unfortunately. Now, we're not talking about construction polystyrene, which does get recycled, and it's not, you know, you use it once in five minutes, you throw it away. So your community can go look at the laws that have banned it uh, in, um, in, uh, uh, in those cities. And there's some counties that have done it, too. So we could get you copies of the laws for you to look, talk about with your elected officials. Another great thing Nantucket had way back then was they had a thing, it was a little covered building, open air, with tables, and it was called the take it or leave it. it. Yep. And you just left like a three-legged chair yep. or something you thought had maybe value for someone else. And then you'd go through and see if there was something you could use and broken lawn mowers. And so stuff was getting used. There was no money exchange. Yep. There was no third party. Right. In small communities where there's self hall, which you have here in the county, those systems are terrific. You put your old books there, your old clothing if you want to, your uh, furniture that needs repair, or your furniture that's good, you just don't want it anymore. And someone will come and either make something out of it or just use it as it is. Um, we had one of those in this county about uh, 20 years ago. And it was working beautifully. But when they went to the uh, pay as you go for the with the bag, 
and they ran into problems with people um, going through all of the clothing and everything uh -huh. and messing everything up. They decided just to disband it, and that was the end of it. But it worked great for a while. People were recycling all kinds of stuff. Well, maybe we can look in to see where it's working now in other communities, to see yeah. well, how they've refined that. Yeah. Well, we've got the free cycle. Where free cycle is terrific, the internet the type stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, Terry McDonald up at St. Vincent de Paul, they use eBay a lot. When they get used clothing and they take everything, including single shoes, which believe it or not has a worldwide market, um, they, they, they um, uh, they, uh, the high price stuff, like a $400 pocketbook that has damage that you know, someone donates, they have a repair room, and they repair the Louis Vuitton, whatever, excuse my French, uh, <laughs> and they sell it on eBay for hundreds of dollars a pocketbook, because these are, that's what these things sell for. I don't know what these things go, but if, half, if they get $200 for a $400 item, they're quite happy. Uh, and and uh, so, uh, uh, in fact, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, Terry is working or helping the Chattanooga Orange Grove Center get into the uh, textile recycling, um, which is a very vibrant market, very valuable stuff. You have to know what you're doing to high grade and get the best value, and that's what Terry does. He helps them present the material so that they'll move. If you, if you go to uh, St. Vincent's webpage and you look at their stores, you will think you're in a department store. Uh, the books are categorized, the books are alphabetized, whereas most times you go to the thrift store to look for books, you, you don't know what you're getting. Whereas you go there, you could ask a question, you could go to the section you want, and you could look up the author or the title alphabetically. So it's a question of presentation. Um, and I, I've seen Terry walk through a Habitat Restore uh, and just go through, you could do this, you could do that, and just make the place more efficient and more, uh, bring in more revenue. Um, so there, there are skilled people who could work with you. The, que the key is, is an old adage. The hardest thing to do in recycling is to decide to recycle. After that, entrepreneurialism and common sense takes you where you want to go. Um, and that, that's, that, uh, you, you've got colleges here, you've got business schools, you've got young people uh, looking for new uh, entrepreneurial activities. Uh, as I said before, jokingly, uh, if uh, you study garbage, you'll never be unemployed. Because uh, there's, well, garbage, recycling, whatever. Uh, it's just never going to disappear. Um, uh, where there's civilization, there's always salvage. Mm -hmm. Another <laughs> adage from, from 30 or 40 years ago that I learned in California. Yes, miss? What can be done with old uh, carpet? You know, if you were well, uh, uh, square feet you're, you're very close to Georgia, and Georgia is the carpet recycling capital of the world. Uh, uh, what's it, is it Dublin, Georgia, or uh, a couple of Belgium. metropolitan yeah. area, and they're they're actually consuming a lot of recycled plastic to put in their their new uh, forms. And Terry, uh, Terry, uh, every scrap that comes into St. Vincent de Paul is used. He makes he takes. Uh, I I could explain the mattress recycling to you, but some of the uh, material fabric in the mattress recycling can't be sold as cotton or foam rubber. So he makes underlayment for your carpets, you know, the thin, uh, basically junk material that's compressed. He also developed a product called uh, pet beds. He takes the material that can't be sold, and he makes little beds and sells them to people who own dogs and cats. As I said before, he's literally an entrepreneurial genius. So again, if you have a lot of something, uh, we can get you in touch with Terry. It, the lot of something has to be homogeneous. You can't just give him a bunch of garbage, obviously. Um, uh, so uh, let, let me say one other thing. A lot of, uh, we could talk about products that can't be recycled. There are many re products we're using daily that can't be recycled, particularly products that, ha uh, that have hybrid packaging, a mixture of plastic and paper. Obviously, you can't uh, do that. <clears throat> the key is redesign. Uh, uh, and American companies are terrible at redesigning their product because they don't care uh, about garbage. They care about their bottom line. And if they can get rid of garbage cheaply, they'll do it. If we uh, change the rules and raise the price of garbage, they'll look at some alternatives, like uh, Whole Foods looking for a composting plant because the tip fee is high. Uh, but citizens have to demand, I mean consumers, have to demand 
uh, uh, changes in the, the design of product. Design for recycling, design for use. As the gentleman pointed out, cars can be produced that way and are being produced that way in Germany uh, and other European countries. Yeah, I, I would like to suggest, you know, the, the question of subsidies came up just a minute ago. And I, I'd like to suggest that we taxpayers have been subsidizing manufacturers for years. We need to dispose of the junk that they produce that we end up not being able to use. And that if we thought about it from that point of view, it might make more sense from a public policy point of view to put the hammer down on the manufacturers to either take stuff back and use it again or to repackage in such a way that it's very easy to recycle, something of that sort. Yeah. Well, that's what these take-back programs, take-back pharmaceuticals, take-back batteries, uh, and other products. Uh, that's that's a, a trend that I hope continues um, uh, because these manufacturers should be responsible, particularly when you produce a product that has toxic materialism. You can't just sell the product and lose responsibility just because someone takes it home. Sir. Uh, you hear so often that uh, if you start reusing old stuff, it will slow down the economy because you cannot sell any new stuff. Is there any work being done to, uh, to assess that economically? Yeah, with uh, 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 it's, a, it's a good point. And in fact, uh, if, if you get your hands on this book, Garbology, which I'm sure you can get through your local library, he traces the advertising genius, the guy's name is Lippincott, in the 1930s or 40s, who started, he was an advertising uh, agent genius. He started teaching companies and other advertising agencies how to convince people to throw things away even though they're useful. And of course, that led to single-use uh, single products. Um, you look about the same age as I do. I remember when we used to return bottles and cans uh, yeah. to be refilled. Uh, now, Coca-Cola introduced, I think, in 1961, the one-way can, and everyone else followed. And now, we as citizens have to deal with old bottles and cans instead of the, the Nestle's and Coca-Cola, etc. Um, we need to put pressure on them. Nestle's, uh, for instance, just decided uh, that over the next few years, their goal is to make all their water bottles out of 50% uh, recycled uh, poly uh, PET, uh, which is a good thing. Pepsi-Cola is about 10%, excuse me, Coca-Cola is about 10%, Pepsi-Cola is, is, hasn't done anything yet, uh, the, to my knowledge. So we have to keep putting pressure, consumer pressure, on these companies. Now, uh, it's, very, it's very difficult because their products are addicting because of the caffeine and the sugar. Uh, we all know how hard it is to resist caffeine and sugar. Um, but nonetheless, the, the least they, they could do is take responsibility for their packaging uh, as they sell us their products. Um, uh, we love bottle bills because bottle bills aggregate materials, makes it easy for companies to come and get. The bottling, the, interestingly enough, there's a division in the industry Coke, Pepsi, and Nestle hate bottle bills uh, for legitimate reasons and illegitimate reasons. Um, but the glass manufacturers love bottle bills because when, when people aggregate stuff through a bottle bill, you bring it back to whatever your depot is, um, you're aggregating glass. The glass company can go get a lot of glass in one shot. Uh, but they don't want to alienate their customers uh, Coke and Pepsi by coming out publicly for bottle bills. So there's this standoff in the industry, and you and I suffer as a result of not having a container deposit legislation. Uh, there's a great uh, nonprofit group called CRI, Container Recycling Institute. It's based in California. Anything you wanted to know about bottle bills. My one criticism of bottle bills is that <clears throat> I want uh, bottle bills that give very strong incentives for reusable bottles. Because reusable <coughs> bottles is zero waste. Recycling is OK, but uh, recycling um, a, a whole bottle is worth more than a, a bunch of glass, because then you have to put energy and skill into making a bottle. Whereas as I grew up with returnable bottles, uh, most of the world drinks their, their beverages through recycled, uh, reusable bottles. The United States is a holdout. Um, so uh, that's a battle you can't fight at the county level. You've got to fight that at the state level, and the companies will outspend us 10, 20 to 1 every time. And that's why there are only 9 or 10 states that have bottle bills. 
because it's such a. I tried it several times. I know. Uh, in it, North Carolina. And it, it takes guts to start it. It's time, energy, money, and um, it uh, we're up against uh, billion dollar corporations that now have. Grocers don't like it either. And that's why we like the California system. We understand the grocers don't want to deal with, with bottles and cans. In California, they set up a system where the grocery stores have nothing to do with the bottle bill. There are licensed companies. Every grocery, every major grocery store has to have a redemption, bottle redemption center within one mile for it to operate. <clears throat> so private sector companies have set up uh, the re deposit systems. You bring in your bottles and cans, you get your redemption value, and the companies keep the material. They get some subsidy from the state, and they sell the material. And the grocery stores have nothing to do with it, and everybody is happy. It was a, it was a compromise uh, put together maybe 20 years ago. I forget, I forget the date. The only downside is they have a very large industry, to, uh, very large bureaucracy to regulate this, which is, uh, is not good. It's a trade-off. Uh, again, um, solve one problem, another one pops up. But uh, if you keep at it, um, hopefully we'll get where we want to go, which is uh, minimum waste and a lot of recycling and composting and lots of jobs. I see people are leaving. I'll be happy to stay here all night talking about garbage, but you may want to get home to your family, so it's Thank perfectly you. understandable. Thank you. I'll, I'll stay around for a while.